Amen. Amen. Give the Lord some praise and take a seat. Good morning. All right. Good morning to all. There um, is another Easter card on your seat. I'm not going to make you do a covenant with me again, but take it, give it out. Did anybody give one out already? All right. Is anybody? Hey, you guys are the best students. All right. Look at that. Come to class prepared. You did your homework. Grab that Easter card. Give it to somebody who needs Jesus and invite them. It's going to be a great weekend together. All right, today we're continuing through Colossians. Uh, the simple thing about the message today is that I want to give you something worth suffering for. I want to give you something worth suffering for. Well, suffering, unfortunately, is an inevitable part of life. Suffering will happen to all of us. We have endured sufferings, and we will endure suffering. This is just a part of life for now. While we're on this earth, praise God, one day there will be a place where we suffer no more. But while we suffer now, I want to do two things for you this morning. I want to help you, number one, understand and work through the sufferings that happen in your life. Sufferings you might bring upon yourself or sufferings other people bring upon you. But the second thing, and the more really challenging thing I'm actually going to put in front of you today, is basically a metaphorical sign-up sheet for you to sign up for more suffering than you're experiencing now. See, that's the worst sermon I ever heard already. I don't want to listen to anything else you have to say. I want you to see the kind of life God wants to invite you into to understand as we walk through this passage this morning the value and the worth of suffering for Jesus' sake. To intentionally, voluntarily sign up to suffer because you love Jesus and because through your suffering, other people can learn to love Jesus. To sign up and to say, I choose the hard, difficult path. I want to present to you this morning that the comfortable, easy road is the least fulfilling way of life possible. And that it is in the challenges and the difficulties and suffering for a great cause that will make your life meaningful and fulfilling and useful. And so do not be tricked into deceived this morning in your life into thinking you want to make things as comfortable and as easy as possible. Because that's not going to lead to a fulfilling life. Paul's going to show us kind of a roadmap for his sufferings and how that might look for us. The other day I was on a trail over by Great Falls and I saw this big sign on the side of the trail, big, big sign. It said, dam ahead, dangerous waters, strong undercurrent, turn around. Now, I was on the ground, so I didn't have to turn around, felt good, felt safe. But I was also thinking how if you were already on a kayak in the middle of that river, it was already cruising. There was no turning around. I thought that sign should have existed, you know, 200 yards up the river. It's not going to work. But when you see a sign like that, common sense says, okay, I should turn around. Things are dangerous ahead. I would like to avoid the danger. Now, the only thing that would change that equation, hypothetically, is if you heard someone screaming for help. Now, if down the river there was someone you loved who'd gotten caught up and was screaming for help, you would see the sign, but you wouldn't care about the sign. You would recognize that there is danger ahead, but the value of that person's life would propel you to navigate the turbulent waters and to risk your own life for the sake of someone else. That's the, what I want to present to you this morning is, yes, there are dangers ahead in following Jesus. No sugarcoating it. It'll all end well, which is great. Praise the Lord. But there are dangers ahead. There are turbulent waters ahead if you choose to take the hard road to follow Jesus, to live a life that counts. But in doing so, you will save others and that you will make a life count for yourself. So in light of that, another phrase you use all the time, especially those of you who work out, think about it simply, is no pain, no, no gain, all right? This is when you're doing the bench press. No pain, no gain, you know, and you're pushing it up. Okay, this is true spiritually as well. I want to give you a spiritual workout this morning to remind you that if there is no struggle, there's not going to be much gain or progress in your life. So go ahead and open your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. Let's go. Let's go. We're going to learn from Paul what his suffering looked like and then translate that over to our life and what that might look like for us. So Paul says in verse 24, Now I rejoice with my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. 
of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. That's where we're going to stop this morning. I want to summarize, I'm going to give a sentence, it's almost like a thesis, to summarize kind of what this passage is saying and how that applies to your life. We say it like this. We willingly suffer and struggle so that we can be good stewards of God's call on our lives to help others know and become like Christ. What do I take from this? This is what you should take from it, is that we willingly suffer and struggle, meaning that we choose to do so. We step into it on purpose. Why? So that we can be a good steward of what God has given us. He's given us this life. He's given us his grace. He's given us his salvation. He's given us an opportunity and responsibility. We want to be good stewards. Well, what are we supposed to steward? God's call in our lives, which is primarily to help others know and become like Jesus. Does it? Your life exists to help others know and become like Jesus. That is the point of your life, especially for those of you who know Jesus. Now your call is to progress in your understanding, to grow personally, but to really live your life for the sake of others to know and become like Jesus. Now I want you to understand this in the, in the thought, the flow of Colossians. So remember, Paul started out the book, we call it primary and colors. The idea that from God, he's primary, he's the source of everything else. There is no meaning in life or purpose in life or joy. There's nothing else apart from God. God is the source. He's the primary color of life. So if we're going to color our life and make it useful and vibrant, God has to be the source. Now, then Paul walks through what that looks like. And one of the things he did a few weeks ago as we looked in Colossians was he spent a whole chunk of the scripture magnifying who Jesus is. He talked about Jesus as creator, sustainer, savior. Jesus is preeminent. Remember, we talked about whether Jesus is prominent to you or preeminent to you. Jesus is the most important person in the world. Jesus is everything. And then he makes a move from Jesus is amazing to this Jesus lives in you. So if you're actually following the text, you're, you're amazed. You're like, wow, this Jesus, he lives in me. And now Paul is saying, my mission is to make sure that the Jesus in you shines as Jesus through you. My mission is to squeeze all of the orange out of the orange of your life. My mission is to help you become more like Jesus every day, which is an amazing thing because Jesus is the most amazing person in the world. So to become more like Jesus is the best thing ever for your life. So Paul sees this, and he says, my mission is to take those who have Christ so they become more like Christ, and to take those who don't know Christ, that they would know Christ, so that Christ would live in them. He's saying, I live my entire life for this thing, that Christ would be formed in you, that Christ would come to you. It's really thinking about that the greatest thing about you would take over. The greatest thing about you as a Christian is that Christ lives in you. And Paul's aim is to work really hard to help that aspect of your life be the primary aspect of your life. A way you can say this, because he talks about maturity at the end. Paul's goal, he calls this his maturity in Christ. So here's how you can understand maturity. Maturity is the degree to which Christ in me has become Christ through me. Maturity is the degree to which Christ in me has become Christ through me, when the pattern of my life conforms to the character of Christ. When the, the words that come through me, when the attitude that comes out of me with where my feet go and what my ears listen to and what my eyes see, all of me becomes conformed to the image of Christ. What's in me becomes the main thing that comes out of me. 
That's maturity. And to the degree that Christ is working through you and manifesting who he is out of you, that is the degree to which you are mature. It has nothing to do with age or any of those other things. It has everything to do with conforming to the character of Christ. So Paul's saying this is my goal. This is why he uses these two very strong words at the end of the passage. And then we're going to get to a few points. Paul uses these two words, toil and struggle. He's saying it's so important to me that you would become like Jesus and that other people would know Jesus that I toil and struggle. These are two words he uses to depict how we should live our lives. Toil is a word that you would use for manual labor throughout this. So if you're, if you're describing like heavy, difficult, blood, sweat, tears, manual labor, it's the kind of word Paul's using. I work that kind of hard to form Christ in you. But the next word is even better than this. He says, and for this I struggle. Now struggle, I'm only going to read the Greek word because you'll recognize it in English because this is where we get one of our English words from. The Greek word is agonizomai. You can guess what that means. Agonizomai. I agonize. So Paul is saying, I agonize and work really hard for this one thing that Christ would be formed in you. And this perspective of his life, the mission of his life, if this is the mission of his life, that Christ, who's on the outside of some, would get on the inside by faith through the preaching of the gospel, and that when Christ dwells in you, that that would be maximized, that Christ would take over, that you would be formed into his image. Paul says, for these things I live and struggle and suffer. Now, this mission and this goal works backwards then to define Paul's perspective on everything in life. Because it sets his expectations. And we all know that we are disappointed or happy to the degree that we have our expectations met. And so Paul knows this is what I'm working for. And then Paul knows this is going to involve some difficulty. But when the difficulty comes, he expects it. Therefore, he can handle it. So Paul's perspective has changed because of his goals in life. And that's what I want us to understand this morning. First of all, is that suffering should be viewed in light of this big goal in life. And if you don't work for this big goal, that others would know Christ and become like him, then your suffering will be more difficult to deal with. You have to have the end in mind. So in light of that, I want to help us see things differently. I want us to see things like Paul did about his life. Because Paul's going to say some really weird things about suffering that don't make sense unless, unless you have the same goals in life that Paul did. So the first thing I want you to see is I want you to see what suffering is doing. Paul has this really weird phrase. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings. This is important because he doesn't say I rejoice in spite of my sufferings. He doesn't say I rejoice out of my sufferings. He says I rejoice in them. Meaning, this is very strong language, that the suffering itself is the reason for rejoicing. Not in spite of, but in. It is the suffering that gives him a reason to praise. It is the suffering itself that gives him a reason to rejoice. Now, why, how in the world could that be? Well, it's all about perspective. Yesterday, I was at Starbucks, and I had ordered two iced coffees and a pumpkin bread, okay? Nice and warmed up, all right? That's delicious. Who likes a good pumpkin bread, okay? That's, that's great, all right? I'm not ashamed. I'll get the pumpkin bread, the white mocha. I'm all in, all right? I got no struggle here. All right? I'm secure as it gets, okay? So you get, get the pumpkin bread. I, the ice tray, I walk in. You know, nobody stands in line anymore. I order on the app. You know, walk in, and uh, I look, and I see one drink with my name on it, and I see the pumpkin bread in the bag standing behind it. I don't see the other drink. I think, okay, maybe they're a little behind. Uh, it already said it was ready on the app, you know, but I'm waiting. I'm being kind and nice and gentle and patient, you know, and I'm just standing there saying, oh, okay, maybe I'm just, just looking around, you know, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and waiting. Well, I'm still waiting. I kind of look like a dummy after a while. I, I don't really know if I say anything. I don't want to be rude, you know, but I am wondering where the other drink is. Well, so I'm just standing there like a doofus for a while. Eventually, somebody has to walk like past me, and I was kind of in the way, so I had to move just to the right a little bit. And when I moved to the right and looked back, I noticed that the drink I was waiting for was standing behind the back, that it had been there the whole time, that I was waiting for no reason, that what I really needed, obviously, in that moment was a change of perspective, that it was there and I couldn't see it. Now, if I was smarter, I would have known that because the bag was standing straight up which would defy gravity unless something was holding it together in the back. 
but I'm not smart enough to put those things together. I learned later. And so I found the drink and I went on my way. Now, it was all a matter of perspective. As soon as I took a different angle, I could see what was really there. And this is the issue for so many of us. When we look at our sufferings, we have the wrong perspective. We're not able to see what's really there. And what I want today to do is to help you maybe just take a little step to the right, all right, and to view your sufferings through the lens of the Bible so that you can see what's really there and so that you can rejoice in finding your coffee that you thought was hidden. Now, Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering. So why would Paul rejoice in his sufferings? What kind of perspective allows someone to rejoice in suffering? Well, what Paul knows is something we ought to know, is that suffering is not for nothing. It's actually a great book by Elizabeth Elliot. I highly recommend it. I read it once going through a very hard time. It's called Suffering's Never for Nothing. But what Paul knows is that, that suffering is doing something. Let me give you a, a verse on this as well. Romans 5, 3 says, not only that, but we rejoice, and here you go, in our sufferings. Why? Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. So suffering is taking me on the pathway to hope. And suffering is leading me to mature. It is helping me grow to become more like Christ. Suffering is doing something, not just in me, but through me. You know, when Paul's viewing the things that are happening to him as he tries to administer the gospel to others, a way I think he deals with it is he says it like this, and I think you should say this over your circumstances as well. Paul knows that what is happening in him is doing something for him and accomplishing something through him. So Paul can say, what's happening in me is doing something for me. I can't see it sometimes, and I don't feel it, but I know by faith something good is happening in my life. Something is forming on the inside. God is doing something for me. Also, God is accomplishing something through me. It is not pointless and for nothing. God is not only forming me, but he's working through me. And so now I can rejoice because two very good things are happening. God is doing something for me, and God is working through me. Suffering is bringing something to pass. Let me give you a big, kind of big picture Bible example of this, as how suffering is part of the means by which God is bringing to pass his end goal for the world, and how suffering plays a role in the big picture of the world, and how suffering therefore plays a role in your life as well. So Romans 8, Paul says this, verses 18 through 20. He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So that's like when, in the end, when all of God's people get revealed and things begin to close out. For the creation was subjected to futility, this is back in the garden when we sin, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So the creation as well, sin has affected not just people, but all of creation. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea here that the creation is suffering along with people in bondage to what sin is doing and is awaiting to be set free from the bondage that sin has created. And verse 22 says this, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together, or i.e. suffering or struggling, in the pains of childbirth until now. Now, the pains of childbirth, therefore, is the metaphor for the suffering of creation, which teaches us something, because the pain of childbirth, birth, I don't know why I keep saying birth, well, that even makes no sense, <laughs> birth. The pain of childbirth, teaches us, you know, it, it helps us understand that there's a pain, but it's a pain that's bringing something to pass. It is a pain that leads to something better. It's not a pain for pain's sake. So the idea being that the pain of childbirth leads to the birth of a child, uh, the pain and suffering and struggle of the world is leading to the eventual birth of the new world. That these things are connected. They say, what in the world does that have to do with me? Well, I want to take that big truth about the fact that suffering is bringing something to pass and the big picture, and I want to apply it to your life, and I'm going to say it like this. Suffering is not canceling, but completing. 
Our natural inclination, which makes sense to think about suffering, is that it's taking something away, it's canceling something out, it's breaking something down. It makes it worse, not better. That's our natural feelings towards it, and there's a good reason for that. It certainly, on an earthly sense, can take things away, can make things feel worse. That is very real. But this is why we always say feelings are bad leaders. You can't follow your feelings into the pit of despair to distort your perspective. You need to follow your faith. What does faith tell me? Well, faith, through the word of God, tells me that my suffering is not canceling something out. It's bringing something to completion. My suffering is not taking away, it's adding to. My suffering is not breaking down, it's bringing something to pass. This is the Bible's perspective and what God is helping us see. You have to think about it like, you know, those little, uh, I just learned last service, they're called skywalkers, okay? Does anybody know what a skywalker is? Because nobody knew last service what this was, okay? Uh, A skywalker is what they call the things at the airport you get on that just go forward, you know? No, we, we couldn't figure it out, the entire service. I was like, what's that thing called? And they were like a moving walkway. I'm like, that describes it. That doesn't name it. I need a name. Somebody told me the name. The name is a Skywalker. Okay, a Skywalker, Luke Skywalker. You get on the Skywalker, and it takes you to where you're supposed to go. This is the idea here with suffering, is that it's moving me forward. It's making progress towards the greater end, which is me being more like Jesus and me meeting and being with Jesus. So suffering is doing those two things. On the earth, it's forming me to be more like Christ, who's amazing, so the more like Christ I am, the better off I am. And then it's taking me to, eventually, this one place where I will be like Christ perfectly because I will be with him. So suffering is the Skywalker that is bringing me along towards this perfect end. Therefore, suffering is not canceling out. It is completing. This is the Bible's picture of suffering in your life. This is what suffering is doing. This is what suffering is doing that you sign up for. And this is what suffering is doing in general in the world. It's not good, and the pain of sin has broken the world, and we need Jesus, but the way we view it and our perspective on it is going to manage how we deal with it. So suffering's not canceling, it's completing. Now, suffering's bringing something to fulfillment. One of the things it's doing is helping us mature and become like Christ. So the next thing I want you to see, then, is I want you to see what suffering is doing. I also want you to see through what Jesus is doing in the world. So see what suffering is doing in you, for you, through you, but also see through what Jesus is doing in the world. You have now a responsibility to carry out the work of Christ in the world. Jesus is working in the world, and if you are here as a Christian and a follower of Jesus, he has called you out, and now he has given you an assignment to be him to the world around you. That's why Paul has this phrase. He says, in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, this is an important phrase and a much debated phrase because it's a strange phrase, but it actually has a very simple understanding. The simple understanding is that when I bring to, when I act as Jesus in the world and suffer for the sake of others, I am completing that for which Christ Jesus died. So when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished, not it has begun, which means that his work is perfect and complete. Christ's afflictions are lacking nothing. The work of the cross lacks nothing. It doesn't need any of us or our help. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is sufficient to save any sinner who would come to him. That is sufficient. So Christ is not lacking anything. But what is lacking is the news of the cross And what it can do, completing itself into people's lives. That's what's lacking. There are people who still need the message of the cross. And its effect hasn't taken place in their lives. And there are you here today. There are people like that here watching. You need Jesus. But there are also people who are not letting the cross and what Jesus has done have its full sway over their lives. They're not maturing. And so Paul is saying that I, therefore, embody the work of Jesus to bring to pass that for which he died. So Paul is working in partnership with God. Another way you could say this is in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul calls himself an ambassador, which means he's a representative of Jesus. And the best way to represent Jesus 
is to do what Jesus did. And the main way Jesus served and saved the world was by suffering. So when I suffer for Jesus, I am never more like Jesus than in that moment. So if Jesus chose to utilize suffering as the means by which he would save the world, then I cannot join him in his effort to save the world without also suffering with him. And if I want to be a part of the amazing thing that God is doing in people's lives, then I must be willing, just like Jesus said, to take up my cross and to suffer with him as a way to bring that message to other people. I can't participate without being willing to suffer. So Paul is putting into practice, you could say, the principle of Calvary. He's not finishing anything for Jesus. He's putting it into flesh. Let me give you an example from the scriptures where Paul uses similar language. So in Philippians 2, verse 30, he's talking about a friend that was sent to him to help him. And he described it like this. He said, for he nearly died for the work of Christ. So you could say he suffered much. Risking his life, here's the phrase, to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Same phrase, same words. And the idea here is that there's a person who came to embody the desire that you had. But the desire that you had to help me couldn't be fulfilled apart from that person embodying the help that you wanted to give me. He completed that. And there is something Jesus has done, he's died and risen again, that saves souls. The message of the gospel will save souls. However, Jesus has chosen to use people to embody that message to others. So now you are the way in which people see and interact with Jesus. And so therefore, if Jesus suffered to complete his work to save, then we must also suffer on purpose, intentionally putting our life in difficult situations for the sake of the cross. We cannot serve well if we do not suffer well. This is what Jesus is doing in the world. He's taking his suffering on the cross, his death and resurrection for sin, and he's applying it to people's lives. And then he's using people like you and me to embody this message to others. Paul says it this way, he continues with his flow of thought when he says, I wanna make the word of God fully known. He says that in verse 25. And the idea being that the word of God is more fully known when it's fully expressed. So the gospel comes to you in word, Jesus died, rose again, if you believe and trust in him, you will be saved, those are words. But it has to be carried by something. And the idea being now that as Paul willingly chooses to suffer, it adds credibility and authority to the gospel message. It makes it personal to people and it shows them the great value the message has. Because the value ramps up the more you're willing to sacrifice for it. So if someone comes and brings you something that costs them a lot, the value of that rises because it costs them something. You guys know this with gift giving. The more thought someone put into a gift and the harder it was to make it happen, the more you receive it as something valuable to you. If it was done flippantly or at little cost to them, you wouldn't receive it with great gratefulness. But even if it was small, but done with great effort and great thought, if it was, if the gift was embodied by struggle and thoughtfulness and care, you would receive that, it would have much more meaning to you. So the same idea applies now to the gospel message and our responsibility as carriers of the gospel message. Is the more we are willing to give up and to sacrifice, the more effort we put in to this labor, the more things we're willing to deal with, the more suffering we're willing to endure, the more challenges we willingly sign up for, the more real the gospel message becomes to those around us. We have to embody what Jesus has done for others. A simple way to say this is that the word of God, the gospel, is delivered by the mailman of suffering. And you and I are the mailmen, male women. And our job is to deliver this word and to do it by doing what Jesus did, which is to willingly suffer and struggle so that people can know and become like Christ. So now the third thing I want you to see is to see what Jesus is doing in you. So see what Jesus is doing, see, see, uh, see through what Jesus is doing in the world and then see what Jesus is doing in you. So this is the crux of the whole thing. 
Because if you don't get this part right or understand it very deeply, the other stuff won't work. So Paul says, now, the mystery that has been hidden that is now being revealed, which is the great thing that Paul is now willing to die for, the mystery, he says, is that Christ lives in you, which he calls the hope of glory. A simple way to consider this now is if Jesus lives in you, then your hope is not on the outside, but on the inside. Your hope is not something that will happen, but something that already has happened. Your hope is not something you will get, but something you already got. So if Jesus lives in me, and the mystery of the entire world and the universe and the ages past has been revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that person is so wonderful, and through faith in him, he has decided to come live in me, and then in him, I have hope for the future, hope for the present. In Christ, I have everything I need. If that's true about me, and my hope is in Christ, who lives in me, then there is nothing else I need to continue on in life, which makes me free and willing to suffer and struggle. You see how this works? If my hope is in certain circumstances working out, or my hope is in my body feeling better, or my hope is in uh, relationships working out, or if my hope is in finances going better, if my hope is in these things, then I will guard them and hold on to them with my life. I will not be willing to sacrifice or let them go. They mean too much to me. But if my hope is solely in Christ, who already lives in me, and who has promised to never leave me, then I become full of the ability to let go, to sacrifice, and to serve because I have that what I need. My hope is not on the outside. My hope is on the inside. And because I have this hope in Jesus, I become a free, crazy person who says things like, I rejoice in my suffering." Because they make me more like Christ, who I love. They draw me closer to that source of power that is within me in Jesus. They make my life useful for the one I love, Jesus. When that becomes my end, my priority, my perspective on everything changes. That's what he's saying. And part of our job now as believers is to help the Christ who lives outside of many to by faith live in men, that they would have the same hope that you and I have. I love how he calls this hope. He says it's the hope of glory, and he calls it the riches of glory. So verse 27, he calls the mystery of Christ the hope of glory and the riches of glory. So imagine if I came up to you this morning and I said, today I offer you riches and glory. Who in here wants to be rich, you know? Now, you'd be like, eh, because you're trying to be super Christian. Of course you want more money than you have now. Okay? You're like, yeah, oh, love. Yeah. Amen, amen. I received that, you know. <laughs> yes. You say, yeah, okay, great, okay, fine. All right. Who wants glory, you know? Who wants to be known and respected and loved? Yeah. Who wants that? You say, yeah, I want that. How do I get that? You got to suffer. And who do I get it from? You get it from Jesus, not from the world around you. Now, here's the thing that happens. Let me tell you how beautiful this is. Is that the riches and glory of Jesus begin to mean so much to you that you begin to trade them out and you become a happier, freer person because you have traded. So what your suffering does is it takes away your riches and glory in the world, which leaves room for the riches and glory of Jesus to take over. You see what happens? What happens to us is we're stuck in the hamster wheel of wanting all the things that we want in life, knowing the whole time that even getting those things won't give to us that which we needed. It won't supply that which we needed. It won't make us feel more secure. It won't increase our identity. It won't give us purpose. It won't fill us. And so what God does as a gift is he allows certain types of suffering, and that takes away. It empties you out so that now you can be filled with the riches and glory that come from Jesus. And what you have done is you've traded out fake riches, fake glory, fake satisfaction, fake pleasure, fake purpose, fake peace, 
and you've traded it out for real riches and real glory and real purpose and real peace. And God is doing that in your suffering. He is offering you something better than you currently have. He's offering you more of Christ, which is the best thing you could ever get. This is what Jesus is doing in you. And this is what Jesus wants to do through you. The last thing as we close now is I want you to see what Jesus is doing through you. So he says here in this last verse, 28 and 29, so he goes through how great Jesus is and he says, him we proclaim. So in light of how great he is, in light of what he's done, the one thing we live for is to proclaim this wonderful Jesus. We're gonna do it by warning people, we're gonna do it by teaching people. And the goal, Paul says, is that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Remember, maturity is the degree to which Christ in me becomes Christ through me. So Paul is now struggling and toiling to take this great, wonderful news, apply it to his own life, apply it to other people's life to see life transformation happen. And he's willing to pick up suffering in order to do so. Now, what you're going to see from this passage as we close here is now you begin to think, okay, maybe you feel willing you know, to do something. Maybe you feel willing to navigate suffering. Maybe you feel willing to sign up. Because this is part of what this is. Like, I volunteer to take on more suffering for the sake of Jesus. I don't know what it looks like. I'm not going to go out there and hurt myself. But I volunteer. I'm willing. Lord, whatever it is, use me. That's what you're doing. And part of it then should feel like, how in the world can a person do that? How can I continually suffer on behalf of someone else and maintain my sanity? Well, this is what Paul says in verse 29. For this I toil, struggle, agonism, I, I agonize, how? With all, he calls it his energy that powerfully works in me. This is the key to success now for you to move forward. It's this phrase, okay? You need to tell yourself this when you want to keep following Jesus and it's hard. You say, I can do it because he's doing it. I can do it because God is doing it. I can do it, I can serve, I still have responsibility. I'm not passive, I can do it. I can willingly let go, I can willingly serve, I can take on suffering, I can bear other people's burdens, I can do it today and tomorrow and the next day. I can keep sacrificing and keep letting go. I can do it, how? Because God is doing it. His energy is at work in me, Christ through me, because ultimately it's not me who's doing it, but Jesus who lives through me. I could do it because he's doing it. And another encouragement for you, as the Bible tells us here, is that God's strength is available to you. You could say it this way, the strength is for the struggle. Okay? The strength is for the struggle. So here's something I want to unlock for you and I want to invite you into, is that maybe your experience of the power of God at work in your life has been limited by your unwillingness to suffer for him. Because you haven't needed certain degrees of strength, you haven't experienced the grace of God to show up and empower you in a time of need. But when you willingly step out, and you willingly let go, and you willingly empty yourself, and you willingly suffer, God sees it, he comes through, and he supplies the strength that is needed for you, and in doing so, you experience the presence and authority of God more in your life than ever before. You say, I want to be closer to God. Good, go suffer for him. And he's going to show up like never before. He'll be sweeter to you like never before. This whole thing will turn from words to a lifestyle. It'll change everything about you. You say, man, Jesus is worth my life. And I love being close to Jesus. If I have to let go of this to be close to Jesus, then take it fast from me. Because I love being close to Jesus. This is what God is offering you this morning. And let me encourage you that the supply of God's strength is more than the demand of your weakness. The supply is more than the demand. God's riches and glory are more than enough to cover your poverty and weakness. God's energy is more than enough for when you're empty. The supply is greater than the demand. So when you're suffering and feeling weak and feeling down and struggling, you, in Christ, have that which you need. The supply is better and more than the demand. Today, I want to encourage you, wherever you're at in your life, two things. One, for some of you, you need to start following Jesus. Christ is outside of you. He needs to be in you through faith. 
There may be many of you now who need to step into a call, who are rethinking of things and ways in which you need to voluntarily be willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus. What does it look like for you to suffer for Christ, to serve others so that they can know him and become like Jesus? Let me pray and we're gonna respond to God. I'm gonna invite the prayer team down front. If you're here today and you want to willingly surrender to the Lord, please come down and kneel or pray. Find a way to respond to God. Let me pray. God, we love you. We thank you, first and foremost, that you have suffered for us. Thank you, Lord, that the good news of the gospel is that you willingly chose to suffer in our place, to die the death that we deserve, to shed your blood. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be so thankful for that, that that would be transformative for us, and that we, as your people, would therefore imitate you in being willing to suffer for your sake. Lord, make us crazy like that and use this church and these people for your glory in this city and around the world. We love you, Lord Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand, come get prayer, respond to God.